Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center, and I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to another in our series of distance learning broadcasts with conservationists and historians working in the field. Today we have a real treat. We've got Robert McCracken Peck uh, to speak to us this afternoon about exploring the West with John James Audubon. But before we get to Robert's presentation, I'd like to just give you a little background on him. Uh, Robert Peck is a senior fellow at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's a writer, a naturalist, and a historian who's traveled extensively in North and South America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. He served as special assistant to the Academy's president and director of the Academy's Natural History Museum before being named fellow of the Academy in 1983. Then in 2000, he assumed additional responsibilities as the Academy's Curator of Art and Artifacts and Editor of Scientific Publications, including, I think, uh, helping oversee those important Fuertes paintings that, uh, yes, that Fish and Wildlife Service uh, uh, owned. In 2003, he was named Senior Fellow and Librarian of the Academy. He's the author of A Celebration of Birds, Headhunters and Hummingbirds, An Expedition into Ecuador, and also the book William Bartram's Travels. He also wrote a chapter and, and uh, helped with the uh, expedition part of this particular book called John James Audubon in the West, The Last Expedition, Mammals of North America. Robert, it's a real pleasure to have you here this afternoon, and we're looking forward to your presentation. And just one last announcement. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting presentation. If you have any questions, uh, please hold them till the end of the broadcast, and we have some time left at that point. We'd be happy to take any questions from the field. So Robert, I'll turn it over to you. Good. Well, thank you, Mark, for that generous introduction. And it's great to be here at the National Conservation Training Center and also to have a chance to talk a little bit about John James Audubon. Uh, Audubon's probably the best known of any of our early naturalists, yeah. artists, conservationists. Uh, but he seems to be getting uh, an inordinate amount of publicity of late. We're, we're uh, finding his picture appearing everywhere. Um, so we're making sure which images we have. Um, a lot of this is driven by, of course, the enormous prices that his prints are, are now realizing, both at auction and through dealers around the country. Uh, they are probably out of the price range of most people today. Uh, things that are a lot cheaper, <laughs> a nice way to see Audubon's work is through stamps. And uh, I did a, a little bit of a search before coming to be with you this morning to find just an amazing number of stamps, not just published uh, by our own country, oops, I'm going back too quickly, but uh, by countries all over the world, some of which have absolutely nothing to do with Audubon, <laughs> countries where Audubon never traveled and, and uh, that don't have the birds that Audubon depicted. But it gives some idea of the kind of uh, commercial interest that Audubon has fostered at, at all levels. He's also been used as an advertising tool of late, and um, I was surprised to find last year as I opened various magazines that General Electric had uh, had a train running right through one of <laughs> Audubon's images uh, to try to associate themselves with this man whose name is so closely tied to conservation causes. We think of Audubon primarily as a bird painter and also associate him with the Southeast, uh, but of course there were other aspects to his life and the uh, interest in mammals is the part that I'm going to focus on a little bit more today. Uh, there are a whole spate of new biographies that have just come out about Audubon, and I would encourage people to pick those up. That they make great reading, uh, and they talk too a little bit about this, little, this more forgotten side uh, of Audubon's life. I'd like to start, or take us back 163 years to the spring of 1843. John Tyler had just become the tenth president of the United States just two years before, following the untimely death of Benjamin Harrison. The eloquent, if somewhat grumpy-looking, Daniel Webster was Secretary of State. In England, Queen Victoria had been sitting on the throne for six years. An aging William Wordsworth had just been named Poet Laureate. And the immensely popular Charles Dickens was writing A Christmas Carol, which would be published later that year. In the United States, John James Audubon, who considered himself a citizen of the world, was about to embark on one of the last great adventures of his life a trip to America's western frontier. A huge comet illuminating the sky that spring caused great fear among many people unfamiliar with the phenomenon. The American conservative preacher, William Miller, 
capitalized on the comet's appearance and predicted the end of the world sometime in March of 1843. Then he moved his terminal date to May when his prophecy went unmet. Brushing aside such dire predictions, Audubon saw the comet as a good omen, boding well for his plans to travel west, first by train, then by steamboat on the Missouri River. For years, Audubon had dreamed of visiting the West. He'd watched enviously as other artists and naturalists ventured into this vast, uncharted region of the country, encountering indigenous populations and witnessing seamlessly endless herds of wildlife. Here, he was sure, were many as yet undescribed species of birds and mammals that had either been overlooked by early explorers or ignored by the well-traveled but scientifically unsophisticated trappers and traders whose interests were almost entirely commercial. For the past 15 years, Audubon had been immersed in a very different world, the world of grand manor houses, such as Knowsley Hall here near Liverpool. Here and in comparable places throughout Europe, he had been soliciting subscriptions for his massive, self-published, double-elephant portfolio, The Birds of America. This magnum opus, on which he had been working since 1810, is the book for which he's best remembered today. The largest and most visually sophisticated natural history book ever published, it consisted of 435 hand-colored aquatint engravings depicting some 1,065 individual birds. All were published life-size, requiring the use of especially large sheets of Wattman laid paper measuring 26 and a half by 39 and a half inches. With the smaller birds, it was easy enough for Audubon's English engraver, Robert Havell Jr., to fit them onto the page. But with larger species, such as the whooping crane, whoops, this is a very sensitive <laughs> advance. Uh, anyway, uh, he had to move his, op his uh, birds in various positions to make them fit. Audubon generally focused his attention on the birds themselves, delegating the flower paintings and backgrounds to other artists, including Maria Martin and George Lehman. This is why some of the plates in Birds of America have a sort of disconnected feeling. Here we are. As though the bird is standing on a stage against a painted backdrop. Such disconnects are rare, however, and most of the plates are masterpieces of composition and design, such as this Carolina parakeet that I showed a moment ago. Compared to the stiff, clinical, scientific illustrations that preceded them, such as this figure of three Western species by Alexander Wilson, Audubon's plates represent a dramatic shift in conception, execution, and effect. By 1838, when he issued the last of the engravings for his double elephant folio, Audubon had established himself as the preeminent natural history artist in the world. But his book was so expensive, with $1,000 a piece, that it was out of reach for all but the very wealthy. It was the publication of his smaller, so-called octavo or miniature edition of the book from 1840 to 1844 that both guaranteed his financial security and established Audubon as the best known American naturalist of the 19th century. At a time when most people would have been content to settle back and enjoy the success of a lifetime's work, Audubon decided to launch an entirely new venture in 1839, he wrote to various friends to announce his intention to create a companion work featuring all of the mammals of North America. The viviparous quadrupeds of North America, as he called it, would be a collaborative affair, with Audubon creating the illustrations and the Reverend John Bachman of Charleston, South Carolina, writing most of the text. The two men could not have been more different. Audubon, the illegitimate son of a French sea captain, was dashing and romantic. He made the most of his French accent and cultured European heritage when in the United States and played upon his reputation as an adventurous frontiersman from America's wilderness when seeking subscribers abroad. He was a lifelong user of tobacco and alcohol, and in his early years he loved teaching young ladies to dance and draw and perhaps more. This is a portrait of Anna Mowat, who was a popular actress of his day, and I think you'll agree that although it's okay as a portrait, it's 
probably just as well that Audubon moved on to birds <laughs> and didn't try to make a livelihood. Your arms look a little like wings. Human. <laughs> Maybe so, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> By contrast, John Bachman was a conservative Lutheran minister, a teetotaler who tried on many occasions to get Audubon to give up tobacco and alcohol. Nevertheless, the two men had a shared love of nature. Let me go back. Bachman helped Audubon with research for his book on birds, and Audubon returned the favor with a lifelong friendship that extended to their respective children. Audubon's two sons married Bachman's daughters. And as you know, Audubon named a warbler Bachman's warbler for his friend and soon to be in law and co author. At the time Audubon decided to embark on his ambitious mammal project, Bachman, though an amateur, knew much more than Audubon about mammals, and probably as much as anyone else in the United States. He was not much of an artist, as you can see from these two paintings by Bachman, as compared to this one by Audubon, but he was extremely knowledgeable scientifically. Although supportive of the idea of creating a book on mammals, Bachman worried that even though the number of species to be covered was fewer, the project would be much more difficult than the birds. Don't flatter yourself that this book is child's play, he cautioned Audubon. Surprisingly, in 1840, there were only a handful of books yet published on the mammals of North America. These, according to Bachman, were, neither, were either incomplete or inaccurate. Nothing worth looking at exists at present, wrote Audubon to a friend. The most notable American books then existing were Richard Harlan's Fauna Americana, published in 1825, which had no illustrations, and John Godman's three-volume American Natural History, just being produced. It included illustrations by Charles Le Sur, Titian Ramsey Peel, and others, but Audubon considered these stiff and awkward engravings as no match for his own more flamboyant depictions. Even his small mammals, such as these two bank mice, show great personality and charm and more life than any of his predecessors. As he had done with birds, Audubon focused on the animal subjects alone, relying on his son Victor to create appropriate backgrounds. Here's the, gosh, this is very sensitive and I apologize for the uh, My apologies through. for the... Oh, here's, here you see his groundhog uh, and, excuse me, we'll go back, and there it is with the background filled in. Wow. Uh, this is his study of Say's fox squirrel, or the western fox squirrel, and here's the plate as it was eventually produced in lithographic form by the J.T. Bowen Company, lithographic company of Philadelphia. And here's another example of sort of before and after. With an ambitious goal of finishing his book in just a few years, Audubon produced paintings at an impressive pace, focusing on the common eastern mammals he had most he could most easily obtain. This is his porcupine, and I showed just for a second there his possum, some of my favorites. He even made a number of interesting studies of bats, now owned by the New York Historical Society, but these were never published in the quadrupeds. As he ground out paintings of one species after another, Audubon soon outdistanced John Bachman's ability to keep up with the text. Bachman's work was meticulous and time-consuming, and he did not always have access to all the reference books he needed. Also, as he had foreseen, there was much still unknown about even the common eastern animals, let alone the rarely studied western species. As Bachman struggled with text in Charleston, Audubon grew bored painting rodents in the confines of his New York studio. He longed for the days of his youth in which he had wandered the countryside in search of birds. And so, in the winter of 1842-43, he announced that he would travel up the Missouri River to the Rocky Mountains to gather new information and specimens, and thus infuse the same sense of originality and authority into his mammal project that he had been associated that uh, had that he had associated in his book with birds. It's hard for us to remember how much of what we now think of as the United States was not in 1840, when Audubon began thinking about making his trip west. Since much of where he would be traveling would not be U.S. territory, he actually had to pr obtain permission to make the trip from Secretary of State Daniel Webster and some of the military leaders in the United States. 
By the spring of 1843, Audubon had the necessary permissions in hand and was ready to go. Having assembled a traveling party of five, the other four all younger men. Audubon said goodbye to his family and traveled first by train from New York to Philadelphia, where he met the rest of his party, then on to Baltimore by coach to Wheeling, West Virginia, and by a series of steamboats down the Ohio and Cincinnati rivers and eventually to St. Louis, where he waited for several weeks while the steamboat he was to take was prepared for his trip up the Missouri River. While in St. Louis, he made drawings, collections, and extensive notes on the various mammals he found near town. On April 23rd, Audubon wrote a letter home describing his situation. I have found two gray squirrels here that do not appear to be of the same species as those of New York. Yesterday morning, John Bell, who was the taxidermist who was traveling with him, skinned several pouched rats, four of which I kept alive for several days. I have drawn four figures of these strange beasts of differing ages, sex, and colors, which I will leave here along with drawings of squirrels. All of the skins of our birds and quadrupeds are also here in a dry garret where I think nothing will injure them. All of our provisions are now on board the Omega, which, we, which will be in reality quite comfortable, each of us having a fine stateroom in the so-called ladies' cabin. The boat, he explained, would be carrying over 100 trappers and other employees of the American Fur Company and half a dozen Indians. Provisions were copious, with 500 dozen eggs, 15 dozen bottles of claret, brandy, whiskey, and, quote, everything agreeable and necessary for our comfort. It was a level of luxury he, that would characterize the entire trip. With the initial excitement of departure behind them, Audubon and his companions settled in for the long trip up the Missouri River. He reported many obstacles in the water. No one can have any idea of the snags, sawyers, and planters that are found on the Missouri, he wrote. They show their butty prongs as if some thousands of mammoth elk horns had been planted everywhere for the purpose of impeding navigation. I'm told that they will grow worse as we proceed further, but how can this be? Audubon did not make any pictures of the landscape of the journey, but fortunately, Carl Bodmer, a Swiss artist who accompanied the German traveler Prince Maximilian de Vide on the Missouri just 10 years before, left an impressive visual record of the region, and it's details from his paintings that I'm showing here. Although Audubon found the prairies visually uninteresting and the hills of the lower Missouri dreary, he found the wildlife and birds in particular, very exciting. At Fort Leavenworth in early May, he reported shooting 18 Carolina parakeets. The birds were skinned, rubbed with arsenic, filled with cotton, and packed away to be sent east with the rest of Audubon's collections. They reside today in the ornithology department of the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia, complete with their original collecting tags, which give the place and date of their collection. Mammals, too, were collected, and their skins and skulls prepared by John Bell to serve as models for Audubon's future illustrations. As the boat traveled north, the scenery became more spectacular and the wildlife more abundant. Audubon described the bluffs near Fort Pierre as looking like cities from a distance. But when you reach them, he wrote, you find them, most, most of them, quite grotesque and often ill-shaped. Carl Bodmer was struck by the same phenomenon. His print of the remarkable hills on the upper Missouri shows some of the same unusual formations. The local people Audubon met along the Missouri, mostly trappers and traders, lamented the decline of wildlife populations in the area. But Audubon and his companions were astounded by the large numbers of animals they saw. A typical series of Audubon's journal entries from late August 1843 shows the abundance of wildlife still found along the Missouri at the time of his visit. I quote now from his journal, Thursday the 17th, started early, saw three bighorns, some antelopes, many deer, fully 20, one wolf, 22 swans, many ducks, 
Mr. Culbertson shot a female elk, and I killed two bulls. Camped on Buffalo Bluff, where we found bear tracks. Friday the 18th, fine weather. Bell shot a superb male elk. The two bulls untouched since killed. Stopped to make an oar when I caught four catfish. Saw 15 to 20 female elk drinking, tried to approach them, but they broke and ran off to the willows and disappeared. Saturday the 19th, wolves howling and buffalo bulls roaring, just like a long continuous roll of a hundred drums. Saw large gangs of buffaloes walking along the river, fresh signs of Indians, burning wood embers, etc. I knocked a bison cow down with two balls, and Mr. Culbertson killed her. Abundance of bear tracks, herds of buffaloes on the prairie. Sunday the 20th, thousands upon thousands of buffaloes. The roaring of these animals resembles the grunting of hogs with a rolling sound from the throat. Monday the 21st, buffaloes all over the bars and prairies and many swimming. The roaring can be heard for miles. Despite his lifelong love of blood sports and his willingness to shoot game animals to supply food for his traveling party, Audubon seems to have felt revulsion for the hunting of animals for entertainment alone. He warned that the animals might one day become extinct if their senseless slaughter continued. Audubon's diary and those of his companions give a good sense of life in the frontier forts along the Missouri. Sadly, he did not make any paintings of them, but fortunately, Alfred Jacob Miller, an American painter who accompanied the English adventurer William Drummond Stewart on an expedition up the Missouri in 1837, did. This is his Fort William, later called Fort Laramie, and this is its interior. Let's see if I can stop on the interior. Audubon visited a number of these same forts that Miller and Stewart had seen just six years before, and he came very close to joining Stewart on an expedition that was running concurrently with his own. This painting by Miller shows Stewart in the center facing off a group of hostile Crow Indians. Although Audubon's boat was fired on during his trip up the Missouri, he never came this close to Indian hostility. In fact, most of his contact was decidedly more positive. He and Edward Harris made frequent trades with the Indians they encountered in order to bring home some of the Indian clothing they saw. This beautiful jacket was given to and brought back by Edward Harris. Audubon obtained several similar coats and a grizzly bear claw necklace. All of the members of the expedition brought back moccasins and other Indian garments. The ultimate destination for Audubon's trip was Fort Union, which stood at the junction of the Yellowstone and Missouri Rivers, and of course has been reconstructed and is there today. Seen here in a painting by Carl Bodmer, the fort served as a base of operations for Audubon and his party from June 12th to August 16th, 1843. Here, Audubon had greater luxury of time than on his river trip to observe and collect the indigenous wildlife. Nor were mammals the only subject of interest for the group. Edward Harris was keen to study the geology of the area for the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Isaac Sprague, a young artist from Hingham, Massachusetts, whom Audubon had brought on the expedition to paint landscapes, made a number of detailed flower studies now owned by the Boston Athenaeum. Although many of his paintings have since been lost or are simply unaccounted for, it seems reasonable to assume that many of the flower details Victor Audubon incorporated into his own backgrounds for the quadrupeds were based on Sprague's studies. Audubon's stated objective at Fort Union was to study mammals, but his diary and the collections he brought back indicate that he continued to be more interested in birds, and at times even resentful of the need to paint mammals. He discovered a number of new bird species and named them after his traveling companions. Sprague's Pippet, Harris's Finch, now Harris's Sparrow, and Bell's Vireo. This species, the western meadowlark, is so similar to the eastern meadowlark that it had been overlooked by earlier travelers. 
Audubon recognized its different song and gave it the Latin name Sternella neglecta because it had been neglected by his predecessors. The greater prairie chicken uh, and sage grouse were shot by Audubon within a day's ride of Fort Union. More often, Audubon was content to let his younger companions do the heavy and sometimes dangerous collecting. He would go out by buckboard or wagon and watch while Edward Harris, John Bell, Lewis Squires, and Isaac Sprague hunted bison, antelope, or deer. They all seemed to take great delight in shooting wolves from their saddles or from the walls of the fort. In many ways, Audubon's experiences were not unlike those recorded by George Catlin a decade earlier. Here's Catlin's view of a buffalo hunt and of a group of hunters on the receiving end of a buffalo stampede near Chimney Peak. That I love this particular one. It's called a prairie picnic interrupted. <laughs> it's clear from Audubon's diary that he carried Catlin's book on Indians with him. He did not fully appreciate how much the Indians had changed, and much for the worse, since Catlin's time. Other aspects of prairie life had not. In any case, whether or not he felt a professional rivalry with Catlin, Audubon was highly disapproving of his book and criticized it frequently in his diary. As much as Audubon loved the drama of the Western landscape and its abundance of wild game, there was part of him that longed for home. As fall approached, he thought wistfully of life in his beloved Minnie's land in New York State. And so, with a portfolio of paintings in hand, and boxes of specimens packed for shipment home from St. Louis, Audubon left Fort Union and retraced his long route of three months before, arriving back in New York on November 6th, eight months after he had left home. Among the most interesting souvenirs of his trip was a live kit fox or swift fox, which he kept as a pet and a model for quite some time. This is his original watercolor of it, and here's the print as it appeared in lithographic form in the quadrupeds. I think it's one of his very best. Another live specimen, which he brought all the way from Fort Union, was this badger. In an interesting reversal from some of his earlier bird plates, in which small mammals were shown as prey to predatory birds, he chose to depict the badger about to consume a horned lark. In some ways, the picture served as an apt metaphor for the extent to which Audubon's ambitious quadruped projects had overtaken and consumed his lifelong love of birds. With his western trip now behind him, Audubon settled back into the drudgery of painting mammals. For a while, some still had the charm and character of his earlier work, but then they became less original. Some even seemed formulaic. Compare this cross fox by Audubon, plate number six in the quadrupeds, with this red fox, plate 87. The pose, the gesture, the general compositions are all almost identical. As it turns out, so were the foxes, not two different species as Audubon had thought, but merely color phases of the same one. Audubon, like the fox, had been trapped by his own ambitious promises and was trying desperately to keep up with those he had made. He seems to have regretted committing to the quadruped project almost as soon as he had launched it. Other factors entered the diminishing quality of his work. Audubon had turned 58 while on the Missouri River expedition, about the time Isaac Sprague painted this portrait of him. And while 58 doesn't seem very old to us today, Audubon reported in a letter home before leaving St. Louis on the outward journey that he had just lost his last tooth and was relegated to eating only bread and crackers soaked in milk. He would soon let lose much more than his dentition. Although his wife and sons loyally covered for him in the years following his return from the West, it was clear to them that Audubon was beginning to lose his once enormous mental faculties. This telling daguerreotype, taken in the late 1840s, reveals the vacant stare of a man with Alzheimer's disease. By 1846, 
Victor and John Woodhouse Audubon had pretty much taken control of the quadrupeds. When John Bachman wrote to ask John Sr. to redraw a jumping mouse, Victor replied that it might be better for John Jr. to take on the task. He never did redraw the mouse, and with Victor's background, it was published pretty much as it had been drawn. This hognose skunk was one of John Sr.'s last paintings, and it shows a disturbing inconsistency in perspective, which represents graphically Audubon's increasingly distorted sense of reality as he approached his mid-60s. John Woodhouse Audubon, who took over his father's role in drawing mammals for the quadrupeds, lacked his father's knowledge of anatomy. This Texan hare, drawn by John Woodhouse, for example, has a lovely head, but the front legs seem misproportioned to the rest of the body. This cougar, also by John Woodhouse Audubon, has an oddly foreshortened forepaw and a sort of toothpaste tube body lacking any bone or muscle structure. Now, in his defense, he was probably working just from skins uh, and not uh, from life, but still, uh, I think there's quite a lot to be desired in this painting. As he grew more experienced, however, John improved dramatically, and some of his, his plates are every bit as good as his father's. This Texas lynx may not have the best anatomy, but it does have originality of pose. This black fox by John Woodhouse has all the sparkle and life of John Sr.'s earlier painting of a Townsend hare. And this depiction of a house mouse family by John Woodhouse may be among the most charming in, of any in the quadrupeds. While John Woodhouse was busy painting mammals in the family studio in New York, and John Bachman was continuing to research and write the accompanying text in Charleston, South Carolina, it was Victor Audubon's job to oversee the production of the book. He would take his brother's paintings to Philadelphia, oversee their accurate transfer to lithographic stone, then supervise the hand coloring of each print in order to match the original. When a decision was made to create a smaller octavo edition of the book, the process had to be repeated, reducing each plate to roughly one quarter its original size. Sometimes the images were kept pretty much the same as they had been in the original, or the so-called imperial folio. But in other cases, significant changes were made. This is John James Audubon's Raccoon, as published in the imperial folio, and here's the plate from the octavo edition, with a second animal added by John Woodhouse. Note that the format has also been changed from a horizontal to a vertical print. The transfer to stone for this and other plates in both the Imperial Folio and Octavo editions was carried out at the lithographic studio of John T. Bowen in Philadelphia. One of the artists who worked in Bowen's shop was Henry L. Stevens, who moonlighted as a political cartoonist. In 1851, when he created a book called The Comic Natural History, he gave Audubon's raccoon yet another life by adopting it for his caricature of U.S. Senator Henry Clay, the one-time presidential candidate and leader of the Whig Party. Here you can see the print on the right, and I think you'll agree it's, a, it's an amalgamation of the two. The humor inspired by or derived from Audubon's quadrupeds was not limited to the U.S., but was truly international in scope. In 1848, just a few years after the octavo edition of The Quadrupeds was published in Great Britain, Edward Lear, the English naturalist, traveler, and nonsense poet who's best known for the Owl and the Pussycat and other children's limericks, as well as his magnificent monograph on the parrot family, adopted an Audubon mammal for use in this cartoon. Lear, who excelled at scientific illustration himself, had come to know all of the Audubons personally while they were living in London, but was a particular friend of Victor's. He had no doubt heard about the many live animals kept at the Audubon house as models and could identify with the situation as he had done the, self, the same himself when working on his own natural history illustrations. His verse reads, One, two, three, four, and five, I caught a hare alive. Six, seven, 
8, 9, and 10, I let her go again. Why did you let her go? Because she bit my fingers so. Was his verse a simple play of rhyme, a humorous account of wild animals caught and released, or a more oblique reference to the difficulties Audubon had had in taking on the quadrupeds? Metaphorically, Audubon, unfamiliar with mammals and overwhelmed by the number needed for illustration, had had his fingers bitten and had had to let the project go. Fortunately, his sons were there to catch it and to bring the book to completion. In the end, they produced roughly one half of the 150 illustrations in the quadrupeds. Thanks to Audubon's inspiration and launch, John Bachman's selfless efforts as an author, and John and Victor's follow-through on every detail, the quadrupeds became a book that far surpassed its predecessors in scientific content and visual splendor. Here is John Godman's plates of the gray fox, just as a reminder, it was contemporary with the publication of Audubon's book, and here is Audubon's. I think there can be little comparison in terms of the quality of the two works. Though it would later be supplanted by a spate of scientific publications growing out of the National Railroad Survey, the Viviparous Quadrupeds of North America was a book that could hold its own beside, if sometimes in the shadow, of Audubon's Birds of America. It stands today as one of the great natural history publications of all time, all the more remarkable because unlike its successors that were created and published with government support and the participation of many researchers, the Viviparous Quadrupeds had been an entirely family enterprise, researched, executed, and sold by Audubon and his extended family. It stands as their legacy today, along with, of course, the Birds of America. Well, thank you, Robert. That was probably the most beautifully illustrated talk we've ever had on <laughs> well, NCTC in the last nine years. That, I mean, that's thanks to Audubon, not to me. <laughs> I know, well, you I pulled mean, that's this the, together. That's the wonderful thing that, that working with Audubon, you just have so many terrific images to go with. My only regret was that he didn't do more landscape painting uh, or uh, more portraits, not of the formal type that we saw at the beginning here, right. but, but informal ones. I'd love to see sketches of him in the field and, and of John Bell or Edward Harris, what it was like to sit around the campfire or, or have a dinner at Fort Union. You finesse that very nice, though, with <laughs> <laughs> some paintings other folks did. And, and roughly well, that's the, yes, thank goodness we had Carl Bodmer and Alfred <laughs> Jacob Miller, George Catlin, because they're really the ones that capture that time. And it's such a tragedy that here we had one of the most talented painters in America right. out in, in this setting. He could have been painting Indians and landscapes and all right. kinds of things, but he was so focused in his interests on birds and mammals that he just sort of blocked the rest out or relegated them to his assistants. Let me follow up on that in a second. I just wanted to remind folks, we do have a few minutes left. Uh, if anybody would like to call in or email in a question, we'd be happy to, to pose it to Robert. But let me go back to what you said. Um, I had forgotten, or perhaps never known, uh, <laughs> that many of the uh, backgrounds for the birds of America and so on weren't actually painted by Audubon. Why was he so disinterested and... and, and it's and curious <laughs> and whether whether he just didn't feel comfortable doing that or he thought that his talent was so specifically focused on birds that he really shouldn't waste his time struggling with a background or a painting that someone else could do perhaps better than he. One of the criticisms that was leveled against him in his day was that he didn't give as much credit as he should have, practically none, uh, to his collaborators. And I, in his defense, I would say this was fairly common in that period. It, it was thought that work for hire was, was not to be uh, right. recognized publicly. Uh, he was the mastermind behind this. He composed the plates, and the rest of the work he saw as sort of uh, incidental to his own creation. Actually, Robert Havell, Jr., the brilliant engraver who did so many of the plates, uh, in the end produced quite a few of the landscapes as well. Uh, as they were running into deadlines and and production difficulties, if he didn't have a suitable background, he would just put in a generic thing of grass or leaves. And that's why in, in the Audubon plates, both birds and mammals, you have a kind of a range of, of background, some with no backgrounds at all. Let's talk about the mammals a little, because they, they are, I think, less well known than the birds, but, but in many ways equally beautiful. Um, why, 
are his mammals so much better? You showed us some of the mm -hmm. early books before him, and they, and they look stiff, and they're not um, particularly in, enticing. Mm -hmm. But I, you didn't have much time to, to go into what is different well, about I, it. Are they, uh, does he know more about animal physiology? Is it the background? Well, I think that's part of it. He was, he was insistent at the beginning that he do as many of these things from life as he could. And you can really see in those early works um, everything from a, a modest chipmunk to a, a wildcat to, to a, a, a porcupine or an opossum that he has seen these animals in life. He, he's got the anatomy right, he's got the attitudes, the gestures, the behavior, uh, and, and so there's a big jump. The earlier illustrators were working from skins, right. uh, and, but there were no expectations prior to that. The earlier illustrators were working in a tradition of that, and, and the same was true with birds. I mean, Alexander Wilson worked pretty right. much from skins, perhaps from some of the dioramas that Charles Wilson Peale had in his museum in Philadelphia, um, so he could get a little bit of posture. Uh, he had seen the birds in life, but he hadn't really focused on that aspect of it because it was thought unnecessary in a mm -hmm. scientific book. Audubon made that leap over into real painting uh, and also into uh, putting emotion and, 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 in some cases, sentiment into his work. I mean, he's been criticized for being a little too uh, anthropomorphic in some yeah. of his pictures, but that's what made his pictures and make them still to this day so compelling. And when the criticism was leveled against him by George Ord and others uh, in the 1830s, 1820s, um, uh, th that he was, he was doing too much with his animals, they sort of missed the point. Uh, he, he, was, he was making the leap from uh, a dry scientific illustration to a, a tome that only a few people would want to read uh, to a popular image that captured the life of the animal he was trying to depict. That's very interesting. I think we do have a, a question, actually. I think oh. somebody uh, called Good. in with a question. Yes, hello? hello? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I noticed that one of your um, slides was of the Carolina parakeet, which I believe is extinct. Did um, Audubon capture a lot of species that have since become extinct, like the, the passenger pigeon? It's, yeah, it's a great question, and he did, in, indeed. At the time he was collecting them, they were, of course, hugely abundant. And he would describe these flocks and darkening the sky, the right. passenger pigeons, or Carolina parakeets uh, all over. So they were, although he was an early uh, one to sound the alarm about excessive hunting, uh, at the time he was making this these collections, he did not actually believe that these creatures could become extinct, uh, certainly the birds in, in that early phase. It was only really as he got into the, the final stage of the bird book and then certainly in the mammal book that he began to see these changes occurring in populations of wildlife. Uh, his own collecting, I think, had had nothing to do with the decline, so we can give him a pass on that. <laughs> uh, but it it was interesting that in his the course of his lifetime, uh, he had seen America change from a place of, of abundant wildlife to one of diminishing wildlife and diminishing habitat. Uh, we look back on his even his last days as a golden era because by comparison to today, the habitats were still uh, in much better shape and sure. much more extensive. But he felt that that he had already seen the the turning point and that America was in fast decline. And that's why he became such an outspoken conservationist toward the end of his life. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I also have one other question. I had read somewhere that he was one of the first people to ban birds. He banned um, Phoebes with a wire on their ankles. Was he actually the first to ban or had someone done that before him? Well, that's, a, that's another good question because there's some controversy over that. Um, actually, William Bartram had some banding experience also in Philadelphia uh, in the 18th and early 19th century. Um, William Bartram, as you'll remember, was the, the American naturalist who traveled south, uh, all through the Deep South, uh, right on the eve of the American Revolution. Uh, and he had seen birds there that he recognized from his home in Philadelphia, swallows and so on. So he, he realized that, of course, they weren't burying themselves in the bottom and mud under pools and ponds each winter, as some people had suggested. Uh, and he, so he did do some experimenting with banding. Others did it as well. 
It's just that Audubon wrote about it, and so he's gotten uh, most of the credit for doing it. He, there's a famous story where he banned some Phoebes that were nesting under the eaves of his house at Mill Grove, just outside of Philadelphia, his first house in, in America. Uh, it, it's nice to know that those Phoebes or their descendants are still nesting at Mill Grove. <laughs> I was out there last spring, and sure enough, there on the back porch was a, was a Phoebe nest. Uh, we didn't ban those birds, but we, we could easily have and continued that experiment. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. And if anybody else has questions, please do feel free to call in. Those were excellent questions. Um, something you were talking about uh, during the uh, presentation was, uh, I think it was the Carolina parakeets were sent back to the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. What was Audubon's relationship with the, the Academy? Well, there, it was a sort of a rocky relationship, I have to say. Uh, when he first came to Philadelphia in, in 1824 with his portfolio of paintings, uh, he thought that the Academy should publish his work. Uh, the, he, Alexander Wilson, his predecessor, had been a member of the Academy and they had been very much involved in the publication of his eight volumes of American Ornithology. So Audubon thought that once they saw his paintings and how much better they were than Wilson's, uh, they would jump at the chance to, to do that. I think had he just let the paintings speak for themselves, he would have carried the day. But unfortunately, as people began to praise his work, he became more and more excited and he began making comparisons himself between his own work and Wilson's, um, always to Wilson's disadvantage and to his own advantage. Wilson had died just a few years before, and he was a friend of everyone at the Academy. And so to have this unknown upstart from the frontier coming in and telling them that their late lamented friend w was not only a bad artist but a bad scientist uh, did not sit well with the people at the Academy. And so. Uh, they did not embrace this book as enthusiastically as they should have. Some members did, and, and they became his champions right through the rest of his career. Uh, but there were enough in opposition to begin with that uh, the Academy did not take it on. Audubon went on to New York to try to get support, failed there, and eventually went to London, went to, to um, well, Liverpool and Edinburgh and then London. But uh, in the end, he was elected to membership in the Academy in 1831, and from that point on, it was a more friendly relationship. And so we do have a couple hundred of the bird skins that he collected, particularly the ones on this Missouri River expedition. Did he send his specimens to other museums also? Or uh, the they the American Museum of Natural History has okay. some. Uh, I think both collections, both in New York and Philadelphia, did not come directly from, well, the mammals did, uh, the birds came actually through Edward Harris. Um, Audubon, it's interesting, early in his life he didn't save the specimens he was working from. He would, he would take a bird, shoot it, take it into his studio, pin it up and draw from it. Uh, but he didn't carefully skin and save it uh, as was uh, practice in scientific circles. So he was criticized quite a bit for that. Later, particularly on the Missouri River expedition, he realized the importance of having voucher specimens for everything he did. And so he took John Bell with him, who was a professional taxidermist. I think Audubon was probably not spending too much time himself doing the skinning, uh, but, but Bell certainly did. And so there were hundreds and hundreds of specimens that were brought back. Why do you think the Audubon mammals are less remembered than the birds? I mean, are they inferior? Was this in the beginning of his dotage? No, well, it's <laughs> part of, partly that. I think it's partly that, that there's the unevenness in right. the, the quality of the work. Um, it's, it's partly that and as much as I love mammals myself, they are not as interesting visually. Uh, the birds have all the color, and uh, the, the mammals are mostly brown and gray. Uh, they were, many of them are nocturnal, so it's difficult to get, uh, difficult for him to see behavior, difficult f for them to make interesting pictures, of composition. Uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't have quite the same love for the subject, so I think his, he, he began to feel he was on a treadmill and he was painting these things because they were expected by his yeah. subscribers, <laughs> rather than for the love of it. But you can see that with the birds, too. I mean, toward the end of the Birds of America, the pictures become much less interesting, and they become composites with quite a few birds put on a single plate. The ones that he did early on, which he spent much more time on each individual painting, are by far his strongest. In the bird book, he tended to, as a very good marketing strategy, he tended to spread out the paintings. So with every batch of five that were sold, you'd get one dazzler, one full <laughs> plate with the flamingo or the great blue heron or the pelican. And then the next couple would be sort of medium-sized plates, and they would be quite nice. And then the, the last one or two would be 
smaller birds, sparrows or wrens or something, which didn't always have quite the, the pizzazz. But then, just as his subscribers were beginning to think, well, maybe we're not going to continue this subscription, in would come the next batch of five with another dazzler. <laughs> And it's those ones at the front of each batch of five that have been commanding the highest prices, of course, in recent years. That we years. see on the stamps and so on. That Probably we see on the stamps. More flamingos and eagles yeah. and those types yes, of exactly. things. Yes, exactly. Although some of the little ones are absolutely charming yeah. and, and every bit is well drawn. But, but um, toward the end, when he was feeling time, was running out, and he wanted to get the project finished, uh, he began asking Robert Havell to put lots of different birds together <laughs> in a kind of an artificial way on the, on the plates. And I think those are the least successful. You you mentioned earlier about him, uh, especially earlier on, uh, shooting the birds and then reconstructing them in his studio. What was his technique? Did he also sketch in the field so he could um, remember the poses they, they uh, We don't he hear so much about his sketching in the field, and, the, and there are very, very few sketches of his that survive, very few pencil sketches. Um, he, he would always say he wanted to draw from nature or from life, but for him that meant seeing the bird and then coming back in with it in hand and usually taking the corpse itself without skinning or cleaning right. it and just pinning it up on wires against a kind of a grid pattern so that he could get the proportions right. And he had to work quickly because, it, particularly in the summer, the, the birds would begin to deteriorate. The smell would permeate the studio and Lucy would say, John, you know, can you, can you speed up with that <laughs> great horned owl? I, I'm going to throw it out if you don't finish tonight. There is a, a very touching story that he gives of, of having a golden eagle, which he had as a live bird. It, it, someone brought it to him, and he had it in captivity in his studio for several days, admiring it, watching it, uh, studying its posture. Then he decided he had to kill it before he could paint it. I've never quite understood why. But uh, he tried all kinds of things. He tried to poison it with sulfur gas, and that was unsuccessful. And it was, it's, it's a gruesome thing to describe. But in the end, he has to pierce its heart with a needle uh, and then paints from there. <laughs> You've talked a little about some of his predecessors, um, Alexander Wilson and so on. And, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, just from a layman's perspective, his images are quite different. What about some of the, the folks that you've extensively looked at that come after him, like Louis Agassiz, Fuertes, and so on. Do they add anything to um, I think they do, I, I, absolutely. There's a, there's a progression there that one can see. Uh, just as Audubon totally dominated the field in his lifetime, and for another 50 years after, uh, they were reproducing bad copies of his work right. in ornithological books. Um, th there, and then some some others sort of come in, but but they never quite have the pizzazz. Then, then uh, Fuertes comes along. Um, Fuertes, this is the uh, American-born naturalist, lived in Ithaca, New York, uh, and was inspired by Audubon as a young man. Uh, in the late 19th century, he went to the public library, and in those days, the books were not nearly as valuable as they are today. <laughs> and so he was able to literally, as a teenager, turn the pages of the Double Elephant Folio, the library there, and that gave him this, this great um, passion for birds, which he then took to a new level. And his paintings, uh, I think, are much more realistic. Yes, Audubon worked from life, and some of his smaller birds are, are quite realistic, but the larger ones, because he had to fit them onto the pages, are often in slightly contrived p positions or right. postures. And because he was working from dead specimens, Fuertes went even further in trying to work from life. And his birds always do seem to have a, a tremendous sense of life about them. Uh, interestingly, like Audubon, he was not so interested in backgrounds. His paintings, the backgrounds are, are the weakest part of his work. Uh, occasionally, he does some fine ones. Most often, they're just kind of vague references. Uh, but the birds are spot on, and they appear to just jump off the page. It was Fuerte's work that, in turn, inspired Roger Torrey Peterson. I was going to ask about, I mean, then we and come up to the guidebooks where, yeah, once again, the background well, disappears. Disappears, <laughs> and the things become very rigid. It's almost gone full circle back to the Alexander Wilson yeah. approach of having the birds in profile, certainly with, with P Peterson's first field guides from yes. the 18, uh, 1934 and really up into the 50s and 60s, he was doing just the silhouette. His idea was to simplify the bird, of course, so that you'd get the bare essentials for field identification. Uh, Fuertes struggled with uh, the interesting topic of camouflage and what was then known as protective coloration or concealing coloration. And so he would often try to put something in a background 
that was the same color as the bird. And uh, he was always in this quandary, does he make the bird stand out so that we can see it better, or does he make it disappear into the background, which is more as it would be in life? Uh, Peterson removed that whole issue by eliminating backgrounds <laughs> yeah, altogether. That's on a white background. <laughs> um, and then he later, in his final edition, made the birds a little bit more realistic looking, did a few more yeah. details on the feathers and so on. Now it seems like Sibley's in it, some ways a throwback more to Audubon and yeah. that it, 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 does he have a little more artistic he does uh, have more interest artistic. in the birds? He does and, and his birds are, uh, certainly have more detail, more th the feathering and, and so on and he's interested in, of course in all the subtle variations in plumage. Peterson's idea was to reduce it to the absolute essential poster version of a bird. Right. Sibley's is to show all the subtle nuances and so as people become more sophisticated in their birding, his books become more valuable. Uh, in some ways, for beginners, the Peterson approach is, a, is an easier one because it's just those couple of key identification patches or spots or colors that you want to look for. It's when almost Aristotelian. This is the essence of a wren, <laughs> basically, <laughs> versus you know, a similar species. Exactly. But there are, of course, a whole range of wonderfully talented artists today working in the wildlife field whose mission is not to produce identify, identification guides, but rather to create beautiful images that we can enjoy in our homes. And that may be closer to, to Audubon's uh, intent. Sure. Let me ask you one last question, because it's where you began with this presentation, and that is, um, you mentioned his popularity on stamps and so on. I wonder if you have any ideas why Audubon has retained his popularity. Whereas I, I think um, Wilson, Fuertes are probably less well known today. Yeah. Whereas Audubon's a fairly common word. And, no, it's and true. He has stood the test of time and more than any other wildlife artist. I think in part it's having a society named in his honor. Mm -hmm. uh, so his, his name is reinforced. So when people think Audubon, they think birds. When they think birds, they think Audubon. And that works to Good the benefit point. of both. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think there's also something about his paintings that it just captures us still to this day. He's capturing a, a bygone era, but also the, the uh, excitement, the sense of life in nature that is what attracts so many of us to it still. Well, Robert, thank you so much for an uh, illustrative and insightful talk on John James Audubon. This was wonderful. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank and I'd you like to thank it. those of you who took the time to tune in and, and spend an hour with us. And uh, we'll see you again next month.